everyone who came early and as a benefit for you I'll give you a reminder introduction because I have a flight to catch so we'll try to do it fast today so after uh, thermodynamics statistical physics and kinetics what we now doing is information theory and for this we needed to define what is information and information is a loaded word and it means many things for many people uh, so to do some kind of mathematics uh, and empirical science with it, we need some definition. And we decided, following Shannon and other people, to use the definition of information brought by a message, measurement, uh, recording, uh, measure it by the uh, amount of uncertainty that this message removed. Uh, in uh, most of the course we'll be measuring it uh, in bits which means that we'll be measuring it by the number of binary questions and this number uh, that every binary question has only zero or one yes no true false there's only two possible answers and we would measure the amount of information brought by a message uh, by the number of such questions. At this point, it may look like it is necessarily an integer number. But of course not, because generally, if we say that every one bit makes half of our uncertainty. For example, we have a set of boxes, and we're interested to know in which box is our candy. So we'll ask, we divide it by half, and we say right or left. And the answer halves uh, the uncertainty. Then H bits would uh, diminish the interval of uncertainty, the, the number of boxes, as 2 in the power minus H, right? So if you have half bit of information, and in a moment we'll see all this fractional bit, is that this uh, it will be, of course, only on average, so you would have different messages, and some messages would shrink it by half, some messages would shrink it, would not shrink it at all. On average, you would say, I've got one half of a bit per information, means that you shrink your interval by two in the power uh, minus one half, which is 0.7, essentially, okay? So it's just square root of, it's one over square root of two. So be comfortable with uh, non-integer number of bits, okay? Then uh, we immediately recognize that if we are talking about uncertainty by object for which we have no other information except that they are this object and we expect the message to choose one of them, then the number of such questions which we need to ask would be a logarithm. Let me start maybe writing. So we recognize that for no other information, the number of bits or number of questions is just log two out of n, where n is potential number of objects. And we immediately recognize that this is, of course, the Boltzmann entropy. It's precisely if we have a number, a phase volume, a number of states like n, but then we say, okay, Let's say we know something about these possible states. So we have the states 1, 2, i, n. And we can know that they happen with different frequency. And of course, the sum over pj over all j is equal to unity, which means that we just define them as a probability. Alternative way, I very much advise you to look into the uh, lecture notes. Alternatively, you may think that inside these boxes there are compartments. If you don't like probabilities, then you may think about that actually the choice is between compartments, but I am interested in which box are these compartments. So the more probability here means that there are more compartments inside this box. This is just psychologically some people consider it easier. So now in this way, we started to say, okay, then uh, every message which tells me about this box would bring me different amount of information than about that box because there's different probability. 
if there is something which is happens with almost probability one and other boxes are pr practically never happens, that's not much information. But then if I get statement that there is in some box which has a very low probability, uh, that means that it's probably has more information. So then we understand that we decide that we now need to measure amount of information statistically. Namely, we take a very, very many messages, organize them into a string, right? And in this string, it will, first of all, the first statement that would be y1 and then y2, yn. And now n is a number of messages. So we were, we were doing this many, many times. And among this, this was the statement that it's in the box 5. This is the statement that in the box 7. So each one of them has its own probability. And we made a very important step, which initially I kind of sneaked into it. I told you, OK, that when n goes to infinity, we know how many times every box appear, right? Because those are probability. But this is actually a very important conceptual jump. It means that from this moment, we are interested in typical strings, not in any strings. Okay? This is, and that's what we, on the previous lecture, formalized by considering so-called asymptotic equipartition. We say that if we, in the limit of n going to infinity, know how many times this, this, and this happened, what we don't know and what every message brings is the order in which those boxes or letters appear. This could be think about letters like this is A, B, and this is Z. Okay? Uh, and at this point, we ask ourselves how many possible ways to, dis to distribute these numbers, and we use Stirling formula, and we realize that the number of possible strings grows like 2 in the power n times s. And s is, of course, depending on those pi's. And we recognize that this s is now everything. If there would be natural logarithm, there would be e here. But because I'm doing uh, bits, so it will be 2 pi pj log pj. This we got just out of Stirling formula, but I really want you to uh, realize what we were doing here. We were treating the total number of typical strings. And these typical strings, uh, respectively, the logarithm of it, of it would be ns. That's how much information every string n brings. And divided by n, that would be information brought by a letter, okay, by a single one. So we had n letter string. Uh, this is the number of such strings. Logarithm of this number is the information. If we want it per letter, we divide it by n and get Gibbs entropy. So Gibbs entropy is the amount of information which on average every message brings, every letter brings, but only on average. And those averages, come in, guys, I'm reminding what we did before because I, I asked to start at 2.20. So in a moment, I'll start new thing because we already did 2.30. So that was uh, before. We recognize that Gibbs uh, entropy is this why it's one of the most important formulas in 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 the modern day in science engineering and whatever uh, is that it's a, a, a mean amount of information brought per letter as long as we know only probabilities not the usual correlations this we will we'll do in a moment then we recognize that just getting this you know uh, a message like you, like my lecture notes written in alphabet, it's very ineffective because we essentially uh, use uh, symbols A, B, C, D, which, are very, which have very different probabilities, right? Which means that we can probably record this message. 
so that we would somehow use short sequences of symbol for very, very frequent appearances, right? And, uh, and then long for very, very infrequent. And in this way, we can have a mean length of the code word uh, shortest. And as you know, Morse was first who did this consciously. And of course, people were using codes, you know, since, since starting spying and already Bible describes spying. So it's a, it's a very old human activity. But Morse is a very uh, a beautiful story. He was from Boston. You probably know it, right? And you know how he invented, how he actually decided to go into this. Uh, you know who was Morse? He was a painter. He was a painter, and he was painting Lafayette, uh, which is another uh, famous uh, personality. And at this point, he got a message which was brought from Boston South for a couple of days, probably, that his wife was uh, seriously ill. And then Morse, it was very fashionable painting. He was painting, you know, like famous people. So he took a horse and started back to Boston, and he arrived at Boston, and wife was already dead. And he was so devastated by it that he spent the rest of his life, or well, most of it, inventing more the code. He was not an engineer. He fortunately had a very great technical guy who invented this thing. This was actually a great thing, you know, just, you know, because yes, no, that was actually using binary signal, no signal. You need to understand that at that time, uh, people like Ampere, Gauss, were trying to invent telegraph. Because already everybody understands that you have wires, you could have sent electrical signal, and there is electromagnetic thing. A level of idiocy for which great scientists uh, try to invent it, you know, th there was like different needles or pentacles. This will be A, this would be B. This was unbelievably uh, idiotic. And this painter was really you know, uh, inspired by, by great pain. And by, uh, he actually said it, that I want nobody ever to feel what I felt when I knew that message was late, okay? So what Morse did, how he knew what was frequent and what was not? How would you uh, go into it? If you were Shannon, of course, or you have a computer, you just you take arbitrary text and count. But what Morse did, he was a real genius. He went to printing house. And you know, the guy was printing books. And he asked how often they order different books, different letters. That's it. Then you know that E is the, <laughs> the thing. So what I now want you to show how you actually do this type of recording uh, when you take something and code it in a different way. And that what makes it so we'll uh, probably start from uh, genes. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Shannon was first who, uh, and we now starting to do kind of uh, real communication theory. And communication theory essentially ask two questions, and we're now trying to answer first of them. Uh, first question is that. Uh, how much we can compress the message. In the sense that how much we can compress the message. So we have this N letters, right? Can we use m less than N letters to get the same uh, information on average? And the first uh, and, and, and the next, which we'll answer in an hour or maybe next week, is uh, what you do if you have noisy channel, if you have errors. So first of all, let's ask how much we can compress. Consider a simple case. Let's say we have alphabet with n equal to 2, a really simple alphabet. As I say, always uh, we'll be trying to do binary 0 and 1. And we have uh, 1, 0, n. So we would like to know, can we use less than n symbols, the same symbol 0 and 1, but arranged differently? Can we record this? Uh, strings so that it would be on average shorter. And now, we, generally, the answer is no. Okay, so you have 0 on 1 on every step with equal probability. You can choose 0 and 1, so you can no choice but transfer zeros of 1s. 
We said, wait, wait, wait. But let's say that I have ones with probability p and zero with the probability one minus p. Okay. So now uh, we uh, say, okay, this is a very, very long uh, uh, sequence. If this p would be equal uh, and each one equal to one half, we could say how many generally uh, strings of length n. That would be 2 in the power n. But if we know that p is not 1 half, then we know how many such sequences. Let's compute this. You see, if you have p uh, log p minus 1 minus p log uh, 1 minus p, is it larger or smaller than 1? Or equal to 1? Let's say p is half, then it's 1. Yes? Well, it's log is always 2, right? So uh, this is log 2, and this is log 2, which is unity. So it's 1 half plus 1 half, it's 1. Okay? So now I'm asking you if p is not 1 half, what it is? Less than 1 or larger than 1? Less. Less. Why? Because of this universal inequality by which we ended the previous lecture. Let me remind you, I spent so much time deriving it, so, and I'll be now using it over and over and over again. And this is property called convexity. This is a magic word which always jump over and, and help us solve the process. It says that whatever p is how many of them less or equal s 1 over n 1 over n. Okay? So now the idea of Shannon was the following. Then in the limit of n going to infinity, again, this is the number of strings. You can forget about the difference between that number of strings and that number of strings because they are very, very improbable and exponentially fast, the probability of longer. Now, if you have that many n strings, you don't need words longer than that number, right? Because you can always say, okay, let me take the most trivial things, namely, where there will be p n times unity and then all zeros uh, until n, right? So uh, this is a sequence which has, which is typical. It has p times n unity. Let me call it by a single symbol, okay? Then a sequence with a hole in it, namely that there will be zero somewhere here. I would call it by two symbols then by three symbols, then by four symbols, and the longest symbol that I would have would be n s. But this is less than n, as long as p is less than one half. This is kind of, as they say, it's non-constructive. It's, it's actually idiotic because you don't want to have your code depending on the length of the sequence. So in a moment we'll design, but it shows you that if you're interested in all sequences, yeah, then you need n symbols. If you're interested in typical sentences, you need n s, and it is less. Okay, let's now uh, uh, give a specific example uh, and show how it actually could be done. Uh, uh, for example, if we have a, a, a genetic code which have bases, remember that it has bases alanine, cytosine, guanine, and timine, I guess, yeah? So, uh, and we want to encode them by uh, bits, okay? So we have four objects, if you wish, four boxes or whatever. And we want to encode it by zeros and one. How long letters we need in this case? 
So if we have n objects, n, so we have n, let me write it here. So we have n objects and uh, q uh, alphabet uh, letters. How many, how long need to be if, for example, q equal to n, there's only one letter. For each object, I take one letter from my alphabet. But if this is larger than this, I need to take probably two symbols to denote one of this, because I, I would need different combinations. So how you would uh, uh, answer this question? Yes? So we need to calculate the amount of total possibilities, so we would need an alphabet for the product, let's say, yeah. in the total number of states is enough. Yeah. In a sense, yeah, so we need to take log of n divided by log of q, or we need to take log of n uh, on the base q. In this, this would be a how many letters? So Q in this power will be N, right? So in this particular case, if I encoded it by uh, bits, then I, in principle, could use two-letter words, right? So if I have two bits, 0 and 1, then I would have four two-letter words, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And they, in principle, could correspond to this, for example. But this is bad. Why? It's ineffective for biological reasons. And the reason that this is ineffective, as we said over there, uh, it's effective only if this object comes with the same frequency. The moment that they come not with the same frequency, this is ineffective, and we need to invent something else. Let's take a specific case. For example, uh, let's take PIs. Uh, what I've chosen, A is half. A, mm, OK, so it is 1 half. 1 quarter, 1 8, 1 8. I just put them in a, in a diminishing order. Okay. So now, what would be our strategy? And again, we want to decode them. This is one way of decoding. What is the mean length of a code word? It's 2. Each one is 2. Okay. We want to wanna make smart. We want to say, let's decode some of them by two, some of them by one letter word, and some of them by three letter word. Because uh, if we take one letter word, that would be already not, not enough possibilities, right? And the way to do it was invented uh, by a guy named Huffman. And what I'm now telling is called Huffman Codes. But it's a, it's a very powerful uh, and very simple uh, idea. So how we would go about it? Where we start encoding? I mean, this is the most frequent, so we want is the shortest. This is the least frequent, so we want is longest. Where we start, from here or from here? How you start decoding? Encoding, actually. Yeah. You want from the bottom of a tree or from the leaves? How you want to shoot down? Yeah, you start from the, the most probable one. You start from the most probable one. And, and then... Well, it's, it's also possible that this was just more kind of cumbersome because uh, let me show you why it's more natural to go uh, from, from the last one because we know already that these two guys would have three symbols, right? First of all, that we, we really want variable, and variable means one, two, three, and they are the same, right? 
They have the same probability, which means that they both need to use three symbols. Okay? So what we essentially say is these three symbols, we want only one of them, first or last, let's say last. We want only last one or zero to decode the difference between them. Okay? So we, let's say, code this one, 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 and this we call one, one, zero. Let me make sure that I really use the same as here. Okay? So now it is only last uh, digit which encodes the difference between them two. Which means that this now is something which I can use to dis wait, wait. I somehow this is T one 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 and this is G one one zero. So now I can use this to distinguish this from Z, right? Which would also be now a two year, a two letter encoding, because this is already three, this would be two, and this will be one. So if I take here this, I would need it to be distinguished from this. This is a combine, if you wish, okay? So I like treat this as a combine, which now I forget about the last one. This denotes either G or T, and I want to distinguish it from C. Uh, a little bit not, so it's uh, one uh, eight, okay? So now, again, because I started by choosing the right symbol which distinguish between the pair, so now I need to choose one zero. So it is now the last one here, distinguished between uh, C and combined GT, right? So when I ask how to distinguish between C, this would be one zero and GT, no matter what is GOT, it's one one. So again, it's the last symbol which tells me that it is uh, uh, this or that. And naturally now, I want this to be a single and to distinguish it from all the rest. How I take this single and distinguish it from all the rest? Zero. zero. Absolutely. So now, when I say zero, I know it's not this, not this, not this, right? Because, I mean, this is now distinguishing like this. This distinguishing like that, and this distinguishing like this. First of all, let's really compute the entropy, and then let's make sure that this is indeed optimal chord, because if it's an optimal chord, it must have a let's of code word in bits, exactly equal to entropy in bits. So what's the entropy? Here's our probability. So it's one half log two. That's what the first one gives plus one quarter log four, right? Plus twice one over eight means one quarter log eight, which is half plus half one plus three quarters. Seven over four, is my entropy in bits. You see, if they would be all equal, that would be two, which is entropy of this, right? And here indeed, average length of a code word is two, and entropy of uniform distribution by two bits is two bits, okay? Now it's seven over four, it's less, because it's, it's not a uniform distribution. Now let's compute the mean code word lengths here. So I have this probability one half length, which is one. I have with the probability one quarter length, which is two. And I have this probabilities one eighth and one eighth, again one quarter word, which probability is three. That's seven over four. So it's optimal, or it's designed to be optimal, right? Of course, it's nice to have rational numbers here, and then when the number is not rational, 
and the logarithm by two would be not an integer number. What Shannon have shown us that this is the closest integer number. You really take the integer part of a word, and that's your answer. Plus one will be already over the board. Okay? But that gives you the idea that this type of encoding, it's variable length encoding. It really uses this idea, and nature uses, of course, all the time. It really uses this idea to, uh, so now, uh, is it clear, guys? Yes. Half symbol I cannot use. I can use one. I, in, in, in this uh, example, I'm using only integer. So I cannot make it shorter. You mean not use three? Or two. If you use only one and two, there will be less than four possible words. The sequence matters, right? Oh. So I need four words at least. When I use three, there are much more than four words. I just don't use other words made out of three, right? Of course, there are many other, other possible combination of three uh, uh, symbols, but I don't use them. I use only this. This is my alphabet. The reason that I'm using this combination and not other combination it's a very important thing, which I don't want to bother you. That's what mathematicians and engineers learn. They say, why in this case, where I have a different uh, length of the words, I know where one word ends and another starts. That's a, a very important thing, because it's now what is called prefix or no prefix. So you really, when you have all two, it's easy. Every two, you know that the new word starts. Now, how would you know? And it's a nice, and it's not very complicated in this particular exercise to show that this is no prefix code, which means that no word is a prefix for another word. You see? So if this is not a prefix for anyone because they all start from one, etc. That's, by the way, if you want to build it from the, from the uh, trunk of the tree. Uh, uh, and if you want to read more about it, there is a little bit in lecture notes, but the key word is Huffman code. This Huffman code is just unbelievably, uh, it's one of the most powerful things invented. More questions? Yes, so in this case, what we're essentially doing is we're doing a, a branching tree where we increase the length of what, how we're encoding the letter each time by one. We increase length when probability decreases. Yes, yes. So I guess as a generic feature, that makes sense. But then the question is, um, Presume instead of C, I had two other letters, each with probability 1 8, right? So then I have A with 1 half and then four things with 1 8. Sure. Uh, then what you might want to do is you would, you'd have to increase it by more than one. In yeah, yeah. I, I, sure. I mean, this is the simplest example in the sense that this is kind of a trivial branching, right? So I did not have kind of multiple consigning probability here, but the trick is the same that you uh, take two things which are equal or close probability. Reality does not want to be, you know. So it's usually you take two which are lowest, and not necessarily equal, but, but closest, lowest pr probability. This is your longest word. The difference between them encoded by the last. And then you do it backwards step by step. This procedure is guaranteed to end after n minus one steps. This is something which is, you know, because when you go from up here, you don't know where you go in branching. But when you fuse, you know it's every time there is less branches because you're fusing. Eventually, you come to, to one. And in this case, it's, it's, a, it, it's a definite procedure which always ends in answer. I, I guess what I was trying to get at is that, um, yes, that, that procedure ends in n minus one steps. But if we were to, for example, again, if we go back to the, the five-letter case where you, you can, where you then have four which are probability one eight. Ah, how to show optimality or, uh, that you cannot get even more optimal using even longer things. Here, this beautiful thing tells us the answer. We already computed that in this case, the word length equal exactly to entropy. That's it. You can do better. We answered the first question of communication theory, what is the fastest rate of transfer? Entropy. You can do faster. Or statistically. It's also something which really I 
I want you as a researcher to look to it. So how it, it seems strange that to measure information and transfer of information and communication, you need to do statistics as if your words have or your letters have no meaning. But it's very important. You drain it of meaning. You want your device be effective no matter what it transfers. Okay? And that's why you treat it as a kind of set of random signals. Okay, more questions here? I mean, this simple example is worth kind of checking it and, and yes. If you want to get more efficiency, shouldn't you drop the requirement that would encode in each symbol separately? Like, for example, to encode digits, you can encode each digit as two bits, but it's more efficient to encode sets of two digits as 10 bits. It's beautiful. It's, I, really <laughs> I really wanted it to give you that. You will have a whole exercise like this. but. Speaking about it, you, you remember that here I say that I would encode uh, of, about of these sequences by 1, 2, 3, 4, and S, okay? But it's kind of idiotic because at the beginning I don't know what, what ends I would be transferring. But this is given for a generic P. But when your P is rational, as in particular here is rational, you may start to think what actually that I maybe need to... Uh, 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 code not every object but sets of objects okay for example in this particular case I would uh, encode this I would encode this I would encode all series by my new alphabet using different lengths and in particular you would have this home uh, exercise problem and I very much advise you from now on to start from time to time to come to tutorials because the problem is starting to get interesting I started really kind of Trivially, but and in particularly when you think about uh, throwing a coin, it's easy to include. This has two possibilities: a cube, like you have a dice which is cube, it's eight. So again, you use three bits to encode it. But now imagine that you have six-sided dice. How would you do encoding? And then you use your idea. Oh, I'm already starting to tell you how to solve your home exercise. So forget what I told you. But the general idea is that you don't necessarily. So you have, for example, six uh, objects, six outcome of throwing a dice. Okay? It has six sides. There are six objects. And you want to use zeros and ones. How long must be a letter? You can say, well, look, logarithm 2 of 6 is larger than 2, but less than 3. But you cannot, you, you cannot use 2.4. Right? So you start to say, aha, I can use variables. But I can also encode not every object, namely every side, but sequences on them. Okay? Let's say I have my dice, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I can try to use encoding for this, but I can try to encode sequences of results. For example, one, two will be one sequence, one, three, another, one, four, another, etc. And so that would be now much more possibilities, but I'll try to get this as close to the power of two, right? Then I would be kind of hitting it more or less exactly. Anyway, this is your home exercise, not mine, so <laughs> I don't want to say more about it. Good. So now, what? Uh, let's move forward, and let's return to language and ask if indeed this inequality uh, works. Then how actually the entropy of our English language, of your English language, uh, uh, is less than 4.7. So logarithm two of 26 is approximately 4.7. Now if I plug all the PIs, which I just go, which after more I go to printing house and, and learn uh, how often they buy, uh, then I would get 4 elevens. For English language, log 2 of 1 over PI is 4 eleven. It's lower. Is it the real entropy of language? Is it the really how much bits every letter of English brings on average? Well, of course not, right? And uh, the most kind of vivid uh, proof of it was uh, that the first telegraph did not even use all 26 letters. 
they were made do, if I remember right, without C, J, Q, U, what else is thrown away, and X. There was a very dramatic story when British uh, started to use telegraph, they caught a murderer. There was, and a, a public imagination was really fired. There was some guy who killed a woman, I don't remember, up north. And he boarded the train. And, and of course, the moment he arrives in London, you cannot find him, right? So authorities in Glasgow, I guess, sent a message to London that the guy such and such took such a train. And they caught him as he this the train. So the first telegraph was not even using these letters, which means that you can somehow uh, restore the letters from other letters, right? Which tells us that there are correlation between letters, right? And this correlation is extra information, which means that essentially letters bring less information because we already know a lot about letters. And Shannon actually measured the entropy of English asking people to predict the next letter, okay? And people are pretty good in it. So we'll, we'll come into it. So uh, now the simplest model, of course, is to use a pairwise correlation. In a moment, well, not in a moment, maybe not. Yeah, I think model would just be a very, very beautiful tool for it. But now let's uh, use it more or less straightforward. So I am saying that <coughs> for every letter i, there is a, some probability which uh, uh, is that, how I denoted it, uh, that there is P of I uh, J. So uh, when you encode it like this or like this? Yeah, P of J of I. I rather use it like this. For example, P <coughs> of U and Q in English is what? One. One. As long as you don't encounter foreign words, which is a proper name of some exotic person, this is one. In English, Q is always followed by U. Okay? It's already a very dramatic example of, of correlation. So let's imagine that we have this thing. This is, of course, a probability distribution. So if you sum it over j, it is equal to unity. Namely, something comes, right? So if you <laughs> sum over all alphabet, this is unity, which means this is just a probability distribution. For every i, it's a probability distribution, OK? And now <coughs> I may ask if this, uh, it's a matrix, right, uh, has uh, in Give, brings me independent information in addition to my vector pi's, which I had before, a single letter probability. Are they independent or they are uh, connected? As a physicist, the moment you see vector and matrix, what's the question that you usually ask yourself? Diagonal. What do you mean? It, it, diagonal means that uh, after A always follows A? <laughs> no, it's not. OK? <laughs> this shows that it's not diagonal. No, I'm saying, I mean, I'm trying, you know, I'm talking to you, uh, not, not as a student, I'm talking to you as a researcher. So I, I'm sharing with you tips how you actually guess things, right? So you have matrix and vector. What's the first thing you check? Huh? If it's eigenvector or not, of course. It's, you know, such things you don't read in the textbook. This is something which you just, you know, you learn it hard way because <laughs> what else you can check? Is this a, an eigenvector of this matrix? Does it make sense? Yes, it does. It's, it's, it's called stationarity. So if you ask what is the probability to come to I, just take the previous one and, and ask what is the probability of coming to it and then coming from it 
to you. Okay? So of course, it's, uh, it's eigenvector. So in a sense, this, is, this contains all you need. Okay? This already follows. Okay? Now, uh, this is called conditional probability. And it defines what is called Markov chain. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, it's after Russian mathematician Markov long ago. And we'll talk more about Markov chain. We will be discussing how Google's made their first billion dollars. They would made it by theorems which are proved by some mathematician 100 years ago. And they added their own theorem. Uh, on this Markov chain uh, format. Markov chain means that the probability of next letter depends only on the previous letter, not on the whole history. Of course, it's not true for language, right? Because in the language, it's actually, I mean, uh, it, it also, but this is a very good model. And in, now we can say what would be <coughs> the probability of a n string. Okay, again, we want an n string. Uh, so we say that uh, probability of uh, how I call it, yeah, I one, I n, what it would be, and I need to take a probability of the first letter, and of course I will be computing not a probability, which is one of the number of possible strings, but I will be completing logarithm of it. Right? So I want to take log by 2. Uh, and that would be, of course, the log of p of i1. And after that, that would be already a probability of a second under the first, probability of the third under the second. So it will be the sum of <coughs> uh, over k logarithm p i k plus 1 i k. Okay. So that's essentially the logarithm of my probability. And it's uh, the logarithm of the inverse number of possible strings which appear here, which means that the number of possible strings would behave like two. It's visible from behind. What is that lower? So it will be n. S i again this i one whatever let's call it i uh, and uh, s would be <coughs> what I need to do I need to uh, take a sum over j p uh, uh, of j i log p of j i uh, all the way to n of sum over k. Uh, yeah, uh, not yeah. It's not j like here. Sorry, I mixed it up. I k plus one i k probability i k plus one i k and k would run from two to n. So this is now the entropy, which can, because this is the probability with respect to this. It's probability, right? For every i, it's a probability. This is a matrix. By the way, such matrix is called stochastic. If every uh, column sum into, in, into unity. So every column is a probability distribution. So I just treat it as a as an entropy, and I ask how many sequences starting from i and lengths n. That many. Okay. Now, if I really want to know how many such sequences, I need to average it <coughs> over all the possible uh, things like this. And so as a result, I will get What is one of the most important objects in this course? Uh, it's a minus sum over p of a and sum over, here I would probably write it as a j. Yeah, that would be 
beta as I write it uh, over j, uh, over j, p of j over i log 2 p of j over i. It's called conditional entropy. And it's conditional because it encounters for pairwise correlation. We'll use it practically in every lecture starting from now. But uh, for now, it tells us that if you now compute this for English language, you go down further to two something. And if you account for three letter correlation, four letter correlation, and also an important fact that you cannot make up words. So not all combination of letters are actually possible. You get down to 1.4. That's an empirically found entropy of an English language. And uh, if you compare it with 4.7, it means that our alphabet is redundant approximately three times. Right? So our letters convey real information uh, which is three times less uh, than you would get if you would use an effective encoding. And this is, uh, by the way, uh, let me write you this uh, beautiful thing. This is not a great city of Boston. This is in a great city of New York in a subway was, let me, Exclamation mark is important here. That was real in subway. It, it's early 70s. There is even beautiful poem which uses it as a line. Can you read it? So, uh, by the way, what it is? It was a real advertisement. For what? Oh, well, people don't do these jokes. You know, then poets use it in, in the poetry, but this was a real advertisement. People really came and get a good job. So what was a good job? Huh? Secretary. Secretary. If you can read this, which means that you are ready to correct mistakes of your boss and errors in letters and your own errors that you are making. Okay? <laughs> this is a poster. There is some very picture of it. This shows us that the language is actually three times redundant. And we are starting to, to understand. I'm not sure we understand it because normal uh, uh, attitude. I remember I first time I heard, okay, I say, yeah, you need the three times redundancy to protect against errors, right? You know, that, I mean, all this old papyri or, I don't know, old text, I mean, you, the Bible, you just look at it, there's a lot of things missing, but you can restore it because you have this redundancy. I think there is more to it. And uh, in November, I mean, we will discuss how our brain works. And apparently, our brain very much likes predicting things. Okay? Not just get something, decode it, and get information. He likes predicting things and comparing with what he got. So maybe this redundancy here is also related to the fact, like, I don't know if probably your generation already don't read Lewis Carroll, or maybe Alice, Alice you read, but not Hunting of the Snark. There is a line there which, when I was a student, we always repeated, what I tell you three times is true. So when I'm telling you something, and, it, and it's, a, by the way, when you'll be yourself teaching, you remember it, it's a very important pedagogical thing. So you want somebody to understand and remember something, you do it during your course at least three times. Because our brain does not believe it first time, neither second one, but third time is true. So this redundancy is three. Genetic code. Again, I already erased our, but we remember that there are uh, four, yeah, question. What do you mean, in the alphabet? Why in alphabet we start from letter A? Uh, no, so here you have defined SI. 
Ah, yeah, this is, yeah, very good question. This is absolutely an important thermodynamic limit, you see? Because after all, we're interesting how it grows with n. This is independent on n. And we average over it, so it, it does not matter. What matters is the entropy which is encoded in uh, transitional probability or conditional probability. This is green function, right? I, it, I mean, just, just tomorrow you can take theoretical physics and, and this, this is transition probability, okay? and there is entropy related to it. Yes? Well, so is it that the sum of all the SRs equal to the limit of entropy? Well, sum with the probabilities of the first letter. You need uh, to weight them with. The conditional entropy different from the SI point here. This is SI. And this is SI times PI. So you need to take SI, wait at it. Sorry, you asked about asking something else? I was asking this question. Ah, okay, good. Now, about alphabet, maybe there are a few, before we go to, to genetic code. Alphabet is very strange. No? Just, well, first of all, we do not convey meaning to each other by letters. We use words for it. Right? Words have meaning. Just think about it. You take a continuous acoustic stream, which our brain, by the way, is very good in dividing into words. And people who have different native languages do it differently. For example, French, who used, you know, uh, every last syllable, they uh, recognize words in a stream differently from uh, Anglo-Saxon, etc. So, Words bring meaning. All uh, ancient writings are word-based. They are logographic. You know what is logogram? Logogram is hieroglyph, it's uniform. It's usually a picture, which means word. This is a unity of meaning. Okay? Now, how the hell, and of course, there are very many such logograms, because there are many words in a language. And then there is a very special elite educated in Harvard of Egypt, which knows all these logograms, which has about a few thousand. And Chinese can tell you that you, I mean, educated person need to know a couple of thousand symbols, right? Then somehow, most likely, it kind of pushed further and further back. Uh, People who definitely weren't elite, there were some Semites in Egypt, in Egypt, more likely, and then there was in this uh, Middle East, between Israel, Lebanon, and etc. There some people started to use 20, 30 symbols. Just imagine, 20, 30 symbols. You, I mean, every idiot can learn 20, 30 symbols. For something very strange, for imitating an str acoustic stream, it was done only once in history. There are many logographic systems totally independently invented. This idea, which is unbelievable genius, this probably, as always, was not a single genius, what, was done only once. All alphabets are der derived from the first Semitic alphabet. Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, it's, it's all go from the A, B, C, etc. It irreversibly change the way we hear, read, understand, remember, right? It's really something which is, uh, and speaking of words, words are, have a very totally different statistics. About words, maybe I'll mention to you, because I failed, so maybe your generation will do it. There is a zip flow which tells what is the probability of words uh, as a function of a rank. Rank just a number. So the most frequent word uh, has a rank one, the next has a rank two. So how the probability decays? There is a law. It's called zip law, one over r. I spent a lot. I'm not a linguist, but I just cannot resist when I've seen it. I spent a few months trying to derive it. Uh, by the way, what is the most frequent word in English? The. the yeah. It's uh, yeah. then off and then end. I guess, that way. OK, good. Uh, uh, we have a lot of things to cover. And I, I mentioned some things that if you'll be interested in, you would know 
what to Google, right? And then go into it. Because there is, it's uh, unbelievably little uh, attempts were done to derive this law, and, uh, and they most fail. Uh, genetic code. Four bases, and they uh, encode what? What this adenine, cytosine, joanine, and timine, what they encode? Proteins. Proteins, they encode not proteins, but elements, building blocks of proteins, which are called amino acids. How many amino acids are? There are four bases, but amino acids are 20. Okay? So we have uh, Q equal to 4, N equal to 20. Right? So we have that many objects to encode. So what lengths of the word we need to choose? If we use two-letter words, how many possible words we'll have out of four? Huh? Yes, we'll have Q in the power number of uh, words. This is 16, which is less than 20, a little bit less, but less. That's why we have a triplet code, right? This is the reason which nature chosen triplet code. Now, 4 in the power 3 is equal to, don't be shy, 64. Uh, and redundancy is again about 3. Right? This is genetic code. Again, I'm kind of, this, this is maybe, maybe random, uh, random thing. Okay? Uh, now, uh, Maybe I just briefly mentioned it's not related to it, but uh, uh, later when we talk about errors, genetic code is fantastically error prone because the typical temperature is just 10 times less than the typical energy of a hydrogen bond, right? So it normally it would make mistakes with a rate exponent minus 10, which is 10 minus 4. Which means, and because you know there are thousands and thousands of transcriptions which happened, would be totally deadly. So it would just, you know, if 0.1% uh, of genes. So there is a, some very smart way that nature corrects. This is called kinetic proofreading, and it's very much like Demon Maxwell. So we'll discuss it when we'll be talking Demon uh, Maxwell, Demon, and Landauer, and and, and all this. Okay, <coughs> and of course redundancy surrounds us everywhere. Uh, a NATO acoustic code, you know, A is uh, what alpha, B is bravo, C is Charlie. It's an another example of redundancy. You denote a single letter by the whole world, and then people can recognize and not make mistake when the uh, price of mistakes is very high. Okay, so at this point, uh, I want to move forward, and so. And we're going without a break, okay, guys? I have a flight to catch today, and I'm already a little bit nervous. Okay, so now, questions, first of all. Before we moving forward, we'll be now using this, uh, this conditional probability in a totally new twist. Questions? Everything clear, okay? So again, what we learned now, we learned about uh, uh, redundancy. We learned about effective encoding. Then uh, we learned about pair correlation. And by pair correlation, we already introduced a very important technical tool, which is called conditional probability. So now I want to take this conditional probability, and it's always in this course. I'm now to want to apply it to everything. right? And this is the subject of, uh, of the remaining lecture. So what I will now do. I consider a very generic scheme. Let me just do it here. So it will be something which would be called input, and I would call B. Uh, and it's not because it's Bob, and then it will be Alice, but of course, there will be Bob and Alice at the end of the course when we go to quantum information. And then there will be output, which is A. OK? And that's what I have. I got it. I measure it, I receive it. And I want to say something about this, okay? 
and uh, it is a completely general scheme it could be message b would be sender bob a would be receiver alice it could be a, b is a position of a atom and a is a uh, a measurement of my device it's just a, a number get of out of my device b could be something which i recorded i myself recorded some time ago and after some time i retrieve this from memory and this is what again this is sending message in time not in space right so i put it yesterday i uh, retrieve it today it's a very very generic scheme i often will be uh, talking about messages and, ex and measurements interchangeably, right? It's really, I want you to understand this. Everything is a message, okay? Any measurement is a message about a measurable quantity. So now, <coughs> what I want to, I want to use this framework, uh, this framework for which B is generally, not necessarily completely determines what B A. So the fact that I obtain A does not mean that I already know exactly B. Could be, this would be a particular case, when my probability is a, is a delta symbol. Uh, but generally, what I really uh, would need to describe this channel, this would be a terminology, it's a conditional probability of what under condition of what? Yeah. It will be probability of some value of B giving some value of A. Now, this J could run uh, 10 to 23 position of atoms, and that could run, uh, I don't know, like 10 digits in my measuring device. They're totally different. They live in different spaces, right? Uh, but still, I can define conditional probability of one and another. Yes? So I guess intuitively to me, it, make, it would make sense of, as modeling the channel as describing what types of outputs you get from an input. In this case, it seems like we're trying to figure out what input we get from an output. Because it's usually what we try to do. We know what we've got. We want to know what actually happens in the world. No, because it's, it's, for us, this is a tool to get this. So we defined it. And again, we now want to measure, like we did over here, amount of information which every such message brings. Okay? So you got your measurement of A, or you get a series of your measurements of A. How much did you learn about B? Okay? So B has its own probability distribution, probability of B J's, and sum of J's is equal to unity. How much I did not know about B before I got any message? What was the total missing information about B? If I exactly learned the value of B, it would, how much information would be? entropy of B. So the total information that I needed or the total uncertainty that I have before obtaining any message was S of B, which is, of course, minus P of B J log P of B J sum over all J. After I received a given value AI. How much I still don't know about B. Conditional entropy. Exactly. Like what it was here. Again, with respect to this, it is still a probability distribution. Sum of any j's would give you unity. So after uh, i, what is left unknown is a conditional probability of b, uh, let me write it here, s of b i j is a sum over j p 
b j a i log p of b j a i exactly like here. This is this quantity, right? And it's sum over j, and it's a function of i or s of a i. Again, if I want to characterize my channel, how much information it brings, I need to average it. Namely, I need to do it many, many times so that I would measure different AIs and I would sum it over P of AIs over I. And that I would call conditional entropy of B under condition of A. So that was my uncertainty before. This is my uncertainty after. And the difference between them is what? So this was my uncertainty. Now it's less. It's less because I've got messages. I'm trying to measure how much information those messages or measurements uh, bring. And it is exactly this difference which tells me how much I lowered uncertainty, how much less entropy now I have. And this quantity, it's called mutual information between A and B. Okay? And it's a characteristic of a channel. Right? So it is uh, S of B minus S of B of A. Uh, is it? Yes. Uh, maybe you're getting to it, but like it's I of A, B, like the universe in each. Good. That's exactly what I wanted okay. to ask. So now you asked it. Uh, any initiative is punishable. So answer it. Are they symmetric? Is the mutual information? Is learning about B measuring A will bring the same information as learning about A measuring B? This is clearly written in a, in a non-symmetric way. But you asked it, so you had some intuition that it could be symmetric. I mean, it's useful when you think it's symmetric. <laughs> good, good, good. This is how, you know, it's like, it's like, why it's called entropy? There is something about passes, right? So, uh, 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 indeed, uh, it is symmetric, but let's see it, why it's actually symmetric. And um, so first of all, uh, to see that it's symmetric, we need a so-called, and it's a very important thing, which is kind of trivial, but yet, uh, let's write it explicitly, which is called chain rule. A chain rule, it's a chain rule of probabilities. It's a pretty trivial statement. It tells you that if A and B would be independent events, for independent events, P of A and B happening simultaneously would be what? P of A times P of B, absolutely. P of A times P of B. But if they are correlated, to some extent. We can write that probability of A and B happening simultaneously, I can do it like this. It's a, a something that uh, I would take probability of A and multiply it by probability of B under condition of A. For every i and j, right? So this chain rule is what replaces uh, for uh, independent just product. We still can use product, but then now, of course, if they would be independent, then p of b of a would be just p of b. Okay? But generally, it's not. So now, if I take logarithm of it, P of, well, of A and B and averages, 
which would be s of a and b. What is it? It's just a joint distribution. So I now have an expanded space in which I have distribution over a's and b's. And I take p of a, b, log p of a, b, pff, sum over all i, j's. Right? And this is equal to uh, s of a plus s of b under condition of a. Now, uh, a gentleman who asked such a brilliant question, now see how you can get symmetry and mutuality out of here. Do I need to start necessarily from a in this consideration? Absolutely not. I can just as well write it as p of b j conditional probability of having a i under given b j. Right? And then <coughs> I can also write it as s of b plus s of a under condition of b. Despite the sheer triviality of this manipulation, I really want you at home to carefully check every step. Uh, just writing logarithm sum over pij over blah, blah, blah. Okay? Uh, and in particular, this is very important. I mean, two lectures from now, we'll be discussing, you know, bias frame. This is actually how brain works also, but this is a prediction that brain makes. Now, if you look it over here, OK, what can I write it? I can now write it in the following, where is my, ah, here it is. So let me take S of B of A from here. So from here, S of B of A is my total entropy A and B minus S of A, right? Now let me plug this over here. So I will get S of B plus S of A minus S of A and B. It's symmetric. That's why this mutual information and its little sister entanglement entropy, which we'll see in quantum things, is why it's so important. It actually measures degree of correlation. It's no causality here. It does not tell you whether A is a cause of B or B is a cause of A. It just tells you that when you see A, is correlated with B, when you see B is correlated by the same amount in bits. Most important part of it technically is so-called sub-additivity. It is non-negative. It's something which immediately explained to us the essence of a second law of thermodynamics and all our problems with uh, Boltzmann uh, entropies. But for the moment, it's just something which trivially follows from the fact that if your A and B uncorrelated, then this is equal to this. I mean, the probability is a product, and the entropy is a sum. Uh, and any correlation lower, uh, lowers entropy. So generally, this is less than this. Okay. And this is the degree of correlation. Now, you remember when we derived Boltzmann kinetic equation, we had this uh, kind of a puzzle that what Boltzmann tell us that if you start from uncorrelated particles, let time run, this particle start colliding, what it tells you that the probability of every particle changes in a, according to Boltzmann equation. And the Boltzmann equation generically describes the growth of entropy. So in a sense, what we were doing with Boltzmann, we were computing multi-particle, let me finish, and then multi-particle mutual information. 
we were computing the sum over 1 to n s of p i's. And we found that it grows. On the other hand, when we take s of p1, pn, something which satisfies Liouville theorem for n particle distribution without any coarse graining, just a true evolution, this was conserved. And we were asking if this is not equal to that. This is a thermodynamic. We get used to the fact that the, our entropy is always an uh, additive part. The answer is no. What was actually growing was mutual information, correlation between particles. So you can formulate second law of thermodynamics as a 19th century statement that this is growing. Or you can formulate it as a 21st century that this is growing. Or you can say, OK, it's all the same because this is conserved within the Liouville theory. Okay, this is one of applications. But generally, what is important is that we just use this conditional probability uh, to define a characteristic of a channel, which is uh, uh, a measure of degree of correlation between output and input, and it is symmetric. Okay? So this object which we started to introduce for language is essentially uh, now let me uh, draw you a, a picture so that it will be more intuitive. So if you have maybe even use I'll probably use it here. I like pictures. Yep. Have colors somewhere. Black colors. So if I would kind of draw this is S of A and B, OK? And then somehow I would draw S of A. And then S of B, OK? Now, apparently, this one. Uh, Would be what? What is this? This S of A plus S of B minus S of AB is mutual information. But let me now present it to you in a in a clearly visible form. So This is my mutual information, I of A, B. And what is this? S of B OK. That's more or less the mental picture. And it shows you the, and again, it is the symmetry only in terms of number of bits. A and B could live in a totally different world. I mean, this could be, I don't know, like 10 to 23, and this could be, be like 10. Okay? Or it could be the visual information that you get, which is like 10 to 5 bits per second, which each one perceives, and 50 bits per second that our uh, you know, retina sends down to, to the brain. So this could be uncomparable. But the picture is always this, OK? Question? Um, what is the definition of SAB? It's a, a formal definition is as following. S of AB, you have a probability of having simultaneously AIs and BJs. Now, you sum over all I and J the following quantity. OK? So is this is called joint probability. And uh, 
let me show it to you again. I, I like pictures, OK? So imagine that you have a1, a2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, a, n. You have b1, b2, b, m, OK? So now, well, it's not enough space. I want more a's. So now, everywhere here is a, i, b, j. So what stands here is p of a, i, b, j's. It's a joint probability. If you sum over all b's, what stands here, p of a, i, is equal to sum over j over all b, j. It's called marginal, because it's on a margin. Okay. When you sum over a, you would have here probabilities of b, which is again called marginal, because it's on a margin of this matrix of probabilities. Question. Yes, exactly. A and B are vectors. Probabilities of A and B are vectors. Probability of A and B is a matrix. So, does this sum make a function relation? And when we consider defining like a pairwise probability distribution between A and B, J, you could also have like AI, like AJ. Uh, Those are entries of the matrix. Matrix is not necessarily, it's M times N which means that it's not a square matrix. But those are entries of the matrix. Okay, That's here, this matrix, what I just drawn it. And every point is an entry. If I sum like this, I would get here by numbers, which is the probability of this value of A. So here will be vector of probabilities of A. It's called marginal probability because on the margin, I need to sum the whole picture. Or I may sum it like this, and here I get a probability of B2, probability of Bn. It will be vector of such probability. And with any probability distribution, it's all normalizable. Sum of this over all i and j is unity. So I can define entropy. Yes? It was at the beginning 1 over n, because we assume that we started from particles uncorrelated. But the moment particles started to collide, they would build correlation among them. So even though the total entropy would be the same, the mutual information increases. And by the same amount, the entropy of every single distribution increases. I have no idea. Yeah, that's really, it's, it's, it's very interaction specific. It's no, what, what is important is that this minus this is mutual information. Or in other words, you may say that this is this minus mutual information, because this is conserved as much as this grows by Boltzmann equation, as much as grows mutual information, the degree of correlation. In a sense, it takes out all these paradoxes out of it, which I, when I was a student, I hated every second of it. I mean, there were really good people taught us statistical physics, but I always thought that there must be something trivial, and they present it as something paradox. Paradox, I just don't like paradoxes. They usually sh tell us that we don't understand some, something simple. Then we call it paradox. When we don't understand something complicated, it's usually a problem. Okay. Uh, good. So uh, I have like uh, 10 maybe minutes. How much time it takes by Uber now to the airport? Somebody has experience. Is Friday three something? I can, huh? I can, I can like pretend I'm ordering an Uber and see what happens. I think it's if somebody if somebody tries to to do ordering a Uber for me, that would be just uh, beautiful because I'm <laughs> I really hate and I need Terminal E, which is probably the farthest away, right? Huh? International flight. Yeah. And. Forty. I don't think it'll be probably not. <laughs> uh, like so this suggests it'll be forty-six minutes. Okay, good. So uh, uh, last uh, last thing, and then we part. But I'll be back from Europe next week, so don't worry. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> if I'll get <laughs> the the return flight from Rome, then I'll be back. Uh, so uh, last thing that I really want to 
Uh, to tell you is a, uh, again a definition, we will start next lecture. From it, 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 it calls capacity. And it's now a characteristic of this channel in its kind of an average uh, or, or, or its most. Uh, so if you look here, again, you, you see that this quantity essentially depends on distributions. Right? So what if you really want to characterize the channel and not what comes into this channel, then engineer as well, Shannon introduced a quantity which is now very important and surprisingly it tells us when we apply it to physics, it also tells us a lot. It's called capacity. And capacity is defined by definition that it's a maximum uh, over all P's of B's of I A B. Okay, it's now it's asymmetric. Because we maximize by input, okay, and it's really uh, <coughs> now. And Shannon proved a very important theorem from which we start next lecture. But now I wanna, as usual, I wanna end the lecture with the same thing that I will uh, start the next one. It was about now noisy channel, because again the fact that this probability distribution is not delta function means that there is definite, or, or this probability distribution is not delta function, means that there are some errors or whatever. You don't retrieve input one to one from your output. And then people were saying, could you even translate a transfer information by a noisy channel? And the idea was, yeah, sure, you can try to correct for your errors, and you can but then they say, but look, I mean, the channel makes errors all the time. So you make a longer and longer messages, like what the main idea of Shannon and of all the communication theory, that you make a longer and longer and longer messages. And in the limit, you deal only with the typical sequences. And that's where you can actually get that much rate of information, which is your entropy. Yes, they say, but the channel continues to make errors. And that's why it was so important that Shannon proof so-called noisy channel theorem. And it tells the following. If C is non-zero, which means that mutual information is non-zero. So if mutual information, if there are any degree of correlation between input and output, there is a certain rate which is necessarily less than C, rate is again how much information you send per symbol for which in the limit of, of, of long symbols you get exponentially small probability of error. This is, uh, unfortunately, it's non-constructive. It's just a proof. Then you need to go and find actually the way to do error correction and all this stuff. But this is something which tells you the huge importance of this quantity and in particular, it's engineering variant, which will be a capacity. OK? So uh, for now on, I, I really now need like something like 15, 20 minutes for, for doing all these examples. Would be helpful if you look at the lecture notes before next lecture on page 32 and just kind of, kind of compensating for this 15 minutes, which I'm stealing from you because I have this uh, flight. But we'll start from this point next lecture. OK? Thanks for it, Uber tip. And uh, last minute for question, for two questions or for one. Okay, I scared you to death <laughs> by my travel troubles. Okay, see you next week, guys. And, and